this stream is going to be about an introduction to pen testing. Um, we're going to go over the OWASP, uh, the, the a couple of projects that OWASP does, um, but we'll get into that in a minute. So, who am I? I am Richard. Um, I am known as Mantis or Mantis STS on Twitter. I am a father to two kids. I am a husband. Um, I have been working in security or InfoSec for about eight years, um, full time anyway. I'm a full time pen tester and occasionally I do bug bounties on the side, uh, albeit not as much as I used to. They're, uh, they become a bit more lucrative, a bit more difficult as well. Um, so, introduction to pen testing. What is pen testing? Uh, pen testing is sort of a it, it's a it's a risk assessment. It's a cyber risk assessment for uh, applications or infrastructure or any sort of asset that a company might hold. Um, uh, so the penetration testing process, we start off with things like a statement of works, um, which is also known as a scope. And then we sort of work from that with the client. We'll get down to what is needed to be tested. Uh, as the tester, we'll go in and we'll, we'll verify any, or we'll find any bugs, and then we'll verify them and report them to the client. Um, there's lots of different types of pen testing. We can, well, the, the four listed or three listed here is web, infrastructure, and mobile. There's are sort of three that I, I specialize in. Um, but it goes to, there's loads of different types. I mean, you can do SCADA testing. Uh, mainframe testing, loads of stuff. And how does it differ from bug bounties? So bug bounties generally are larger scopes. Um, they will provide you with, for example, wildcard.example.com. And that is a huge scope, The potentially a huge scope anyway. The uh, methodology would be completely different. Um, and also bug bounties always, or at least tend to require a exploitable bug to to pay out whereas a pen test will give you a smaller scope for example it might just be one website or one application or a small section of a network and then you have to find bugs within that and you have to try and escalate as much as you can generally speaking um, however there are cases where you'll have a really small scope and they'll just say look we just want to test this one thing uh, don't go outside the scope of that um, and pen testing you report bugs that aren't necessarily exploitable. They're theoretical bugs, uh, more like things like Poodle, the SSL Poodle. Um, yeah. So terminology, before we get any further, let's just go over a few things to, to make sure we're all on the same page. Virtual machine is just an operating machine running in a virtualized environment on your computer. It is, we, as pen testers, we use them quite a lot. Um, I'm sure most IT sectors do. But it allows us to segregate our testing machines from our base operating system. Um, and we we can do that with a number of softwares. So there's things like VirtualBox, there's VMware, Hyper-V, just to name a few. Uh, so HTTP proxy, that's something that uh, literally proxies a HTTP request and response to and from your computer to the web server. Um, that allows us to essentially perform a man in the middle attack. So if there's a, if you want to say submit a post form onto onto a website, you can intercept that, and then see and modify the the traffic that's going to and from it. Um, there are some requirements you have to do if it's a TLS connection, but that's just sort of not important for the for the sake of doing this presentation. Uh, so examples of a HTTP proxy would be Burp Suite, uh, Zap Proxy, which is OWASP's own proxy. I believe it's OWASP. Uh, so what's a pen tester? A pen tester is again somebody that does a penetration test. Fairly straightforward. Uh, what is OWASP? OWASP is the Open Web Application Security Project. Um, it is a collaboration of lots of different areas. Um, so primarily we look at the sort of the, the OWASP SOC 10 and the security testing guides. Um, there is also the security, oh, sorry, the secure coding practices. Uh, they're all amazing projects. I suggest everyone go and check them out because they really are great. So that's what the OWASP top 10 looks like from, it changed from 2017 to 2021. Um, I'm not gonna go through them, but you can, you can see them there. 
So the, the ones that we're going to look at today um, in sort of a shallow depth, we're going to go into a bit more in, in the future. But the ones we're going to look at today are the top three. So we've got broken access control, cryptographic failures, and injection. Um, again, only at a top level. So I'm going to briefly go over what they are, what they mean, and a couple of examples. And then I'll probably do a lab if I've got time. I uh, don't know what time it is now. Yeah, we'll, we'll have time. We'll have time. So I'll do a lab probably on each of them um, and show you, show you sort of an example of everything. Uh, but in the future, I want to dive deeper into that. I want to I want to show sort of a lot more examples of these uh, categories and, and different types of bugs that, that, that are in them. So what's the benefit of, of OWASP? Um, it defines a set of common security vulnerabilities around applications. So it gives us a sort of a, a guideline to, for things to test for. Um, and it also provides us a, a remediation for these issues. So part of being a pen tester is we have to suggest a recommendation for the client. So we can't just go in and say, hey, you've got these issues uh, without going back to them and saying, this is how we recommend you fix them. So OWASP gives us that, uh, that sort of in-depth knowledge as well of how to fix these issues. Um, generally speaking, and again, I know I'm going off topic here, but if we recommend something to a client, we don't normally recommend exact fixes. We will recommend the overall solution, for example, with cross-site scripting, just as an example. We wouldn't recommend an exact function or uh, method to use to fix the issue, but we would say, hey, look, output encoding is important. You should be output. You should be encoding your outputs um, to to prevent this happening. And also, OWASP uh, provides a, a testing methodology which is it makes it makes penetration testing consistent between uh, not only companies but also testers themselves. So, what is a what what is penetration testing? Uh, like I said before, it's glorified risk assessments. We have small scope, uh, small scopes, and as a pen tester, you tend to be a jack of all trades. So, uh, like I, I specialize in web. Uh, well, I specialize in most things application based, but I do a bit of infrastructure. I do a bit of uh, Wi-Fi testing. I do. Uh, I've done some SCADA testing in the past. So, even though you might not specialize in it, there's always a lot of sort of give and take between you, at least where I've worked. Uh, there's a lot of give and take between the client and the, or sorry, between the employer and the employee. So they expect you to know, at least as you get to a senior level, they expect you to know enough about a lot of different things so you can sort of test a, a variety of things. Um, and soft skills are one of the biggest sort of, what, soft skills are one of the biggest things I recommend getting better at. I'm not perfect at it, especially on like the microphone or phone calls and things like that. I'm not very good at speaking to people, but writing reports, I mean, it, it's it's basically the only thing that we sell. So even though we are pen testers, we are also just selling them a report. The, the, the only thing they get at the end of it is a piece of paper that says this is what's wrong with it. So your skills in writing these reports have to be amazing. Um, obviously, that comes with time. It's not something that should put you off getting into pen testing to begin with. Uh, but th that is something to consider, right? If you're not very good at writing, try and get better. Um, another thing that we do consistently um, for clients is reoccurring tests. So every year, a client will come back to us and say, hey, we want the same test done, same scope, same everything. It becomes tedious, but it, it's part of the job. Um, bug, bounties, bug bounties are not penetration tests. So a bug bounty, so a pen test is generally sort of the first line of defense. Um, we will go in on say a three or four day scope, um, and we will go. Okay, we'll find everything we can. We'll report all the missing security headers. We'll miss. We'll, we'll report all the sort of cookie flags and cross site scripting and anything that's glaringly obvious. Whereas a pen test, uh, sorry, whereas a bug bounty is more in depth. You've got usually as much time as you want on it. Uh, the scopes are bigger, again, generally speaking. Um, so there are differences there. Uh, I think people conflate the two. But yeah, pen tests are not the same as bug bounties. And reports can be really large. So they, they can be 
I mean, I've written a report that was like 200 and something pages long. So they're not, they can be a long, long report. Um, if, if you're not, if you're not up for sort of writing that sort of report, it's, it, it can be, it can be a tedious task. Um, and you need to also, when you, when you write these reports, I'm, I've, gone, I've gone off on a big tangent here, but when you're writing these reports, you normally have to think about who the reader is. So the reader for a lot of companies will not be technical. So you might have a technical contact at the company, but the ones that you're speaking to won't be. Um, or sorry, the ones that are reading the report won't be. So you have to write them in a, in a way that everyone can understand, which can be quite difficult. Uh, so just a, a small sort of snippet of what I just said was writing a comprehensive and coherent report as penetration tester as a penetration tester is one of the most important skills to have. Um, I, I think that's sort of true. I, I, I don't know anybody in pen testing who gets away with not writing reports or decent reports anyway. Um, and on the on the back side of that, prevention steps are described within the OWASP documents. So that gives us as pen testers a know how how to recommend fixes for the clients. Again, uh, we have to tell these clients how to fix their stuff uh, in layman terms. So again, they, they're not technical, at least some of them aren't technical. Um, generally, hopefully, you would hope that the people who are reading the report and trying to fix it will be technical, at least to a degree. Um, but there's been plenty of times where I've issued a report to a client, the developers have gotten hold of it, and they come back and go, well, you know, we, we don't see the issue. So you have to then, even though they're technical, you still have to give them a, a real sort of rundown on, on what's going on. So moving on to broken access controls, like I said, we're going to get into sort of into specific issues. Um, I'm going to try and break it down to a, to a semi-decent level, I hope. Um, so the first one we decided on was broken access controls, which is uh, or one of the sort of subcategories of that would be IDOR, in, Insecure Direct Object Reference. Um, so what's an IDOR? It's a method to enumerate objects or entities or entries that don't belong to you. Um, for example, if you have a user account that has, in fact, I'll show you that in a minute. I've got an example of that. Um, and ultimately it boils down to being a circumvention of access controls. And it can, and I've seen this happen, but it's not, I, I was, in fact, I was having a uh, discussion with somebody on Slack earlier, whether it's a privilege escalation or not. But I believe you can, you, you could classify it loosely as a privilege escalation in some cases. So here we've got, oh, sorry. So we've got the, the, the user saying, hey, can I have the document number 1000? And the, the, the website's going, yeah, of course, you own that, no problem. Or you have access to that, no problem. Um, and then an attacker might say, hey, can I have access to 1002? And the, the server, because it doesn't understand that there's sort of a level of uh, protection missing, I guess, it says, hey, yeah, no worries, have it back. You know, have, have, have 102 as well, or 1002 as well. So what's the impact? Um, so you can have, you can basically gain access to sensitive data, unauthorized. Um, files as well. Um, Idol's not just relation, it doesn't just relate to databases, it can relate to files. Um, you can potentially update, modify, and delete data that doesn't belong to you. And again, there's the potential for privilege escalation there um, in certain situations. So here's a little code example I put together. Um, nothing, nothing too special, but uh, if you can't read it or anything like that, let me know and I'll, I'll see what I can do. But we've got the prepared statement here, which should be fine. That's, that's not a problem. Uh, you, so we, we're sort of not worried about anything else except IDOR at the moment. Um, and then you pass in a ID from, from the get parameter and then you fetch all the results. So if you own get ID one and it, it fetches the results for you, that's fine. You get, you get a result. But what happens when you don't own get ID one or one thousand or one thousand and one? It's still going to fetch it all for you. So regardless whether um, you own the document or not, or, or the the entry and the object in the database, you still fetch it back. Now, obviously, in this case, we're looking at name, address, and bank details. 
So if that was your ID, that's fine. You know your name, address, and bank details. But can you imagine if it was somebody else's name, address, and bank details, or you could enumerate over them? That that that's sort of more of more call for concern. So remediation, never rely on obscurity, because uh, e even if you're using GUIDs and things, if somebody finds out your GUID or a related GUID or a completely different GUID, it's no longer secret. So it doesn't matter how obscure it is. If you can, if somebody can, what's DBH? Oh, that would have been the, it, it was a connection string. Um, sorry. Uh, where was I? Yeah, all objects should be controlled with an ACL. So access control list. Um, so even if you had 1001, 1002, 1003, as long as they're correctly locked down, it doesn't matter. So although you, you could prove their existence, um, as in it might just say access denied rather than a 404, but unless you can see that data, it doesn't matter. So as long as they're locked down with an ACL, that's fine. Um, however, contradicting what I just previously said, ideally you should still use GUIDs. So it's sort of a multi-layer defense. You you can have, uh, obviously you could have 1001, 1002, 1003 as long as it's locked down properly, but that makes it enumerable. So if you can have a GUID instead, which is just a long unique string of letters and numbers, then you wouldn't be able to you wouldn't be able to just enumerate it, um, which again adds in that extra layer of defense there. So moving on is to cryptographic failures. Uh, what is a cryptographic failure? Uh, it can be <laughs> as when I was doing my research for the slide, it can be a lot of things. Um, clear text protocols, HTTP, FTP, SMTP, Telnet, uh, just to name a few. Obviously, none of them have encryption. You can obviously enable encryption, so you can have HTTPS, FTPS, or SFTP. Uh, SMTP encrypted telnet is, you can't have encryption, I don't think, but you can have SSH. Um, and also there's, there's occasionally confusion around encoding versus encryption versus hashing and what they are. Um, I will get into that in a minute. I've got a, another slide on that. Um, so other cryptographic failures are things like weak SSL and TLS configurations and certificates. So you've got Lucky 13, Poodle, uh, which are due to weak ciphers, CPC ciphers and, and all that. Uh, trusted certificates or more to the point, untrusted certificates, where maybe you've got a certificate issued by a local, not authority, but like a, uh, a self-signed certificate and also weak hashing algorithms. So when you hash the or when, when you get a signature on the on the certificate, you used to be able to sign it with MD5 or SHA-1, and you still surprisingly see quite a few of those. But nowadays, you want to see SHA-2. Uh, yeah, I think that's the only supported one, to be honest. Default keys, again. So if you've got a, off the top of my head, if you've got a router, or, or a router, whatever way you want to say it, and they get shipped with default keys and you don't update the keys, that's a cryptographic failure. Um, arguably, it's also a sort of configuration issue, but I'm going on what OWASP said. So apparently that's a cryptographic failure. Um, predictable seeds in pseudo-random number generators, um, which means that, it, for example, there, there's, I, the function name's gone from my head. But there's a function in Python that if you don't, if you seed it with the same seed, it will produce the same result every time. So if that's a predictable seed, you can then go back and, and feed that seed, uh, feed that function with a known seed and get the same result back. Um, obviously, if that result is a password or a hash or whatever you're sort of getting from that function, then that could be quite bad. So hashing versus encoding versus encryption. So hashing is only one way. Um, it can be used for things like passwords and checksums to, or passwords obviously to garble up the passwords and, and produce something completely unreadable. Uh, checksums obviously to make sure that your files or whatever you're checking are the same as they were previously. Like on a server, if you download a file, 
and then you want to make sure it match the one you've downloaded matches the one on the server you can do the checksum you check the checksums um, and examples of these are things like md5 sha1 sha2 uh, decrypt loads and loads of hashes sorry encryption um, encryption is bidirectional so you can obviously encrypt it and decrypt it that can be used for things like any any information that you want to store safely but you also need it back in in, in sort of plain text at some point uh, that could be secret files um, anything like that that was just off the top of my head secret files that will do um, <laughs> Yeah, sorry, by the way, if I'm going too fast or anything, just shoot me a message or, you know, drop drop a drop a message in chat and I'll, I'll slow down or I'll explain something else. Um, but yes, it needs to be, it, encryption is always bi-directional. Um, it, it's for things like, like say, secure files or um, even things like databases can be encrypted, but it's always, it's always one way to, it always, sorry, I'm reading chat at the same time now. Uh, sorry, yeah, it, it, it can always be reversed. So things like HTTPS, uh, data in transit versus data at rest. So data in transit is obviously when you, you, you're you sending the data somewhere. Um, that needs to be encrypted to stop you from doing man-in-the-middle attacks. But if it's if it wasn't sort of decryptable at the other end, you wouldn't know what you've just received. Please explain hashing in little detail. Sure, I'll get back to that in a second. Um, yeah, and data at rest is where, again, you're storing files on a server or something um, and, and you need them to be secure, but you also need to be able to read them again at some point. And encoding, finally, is just for uniformity of data and it's not for sensitive data because encoding is always reversible. Uh, and, you know, it's not supposed to be secure. It's just to uh, sort of, well, again, make it uniform. For example, base64, you make it uniform in a way that you know, no matter what you chuck at it, it will decode or encode into something you know how to deal with. Um, and then you can pass it back to a, a decoder or an encoder, whichever way you look at it, and you can sort of get your data back. Um, so, Skiom, and I'm sorry if I say that wrong, in the chat says, please explain hashing. So hashing, again, is a one-way uh, system. And in fact, I can do I can do this better. So let's go to three val.org. And we've got PHP. And we can just do, let me just, I don't know how much you can see that. So we can do an MD5 hash test. So this will always produce the same, but it's a garbled sort of mess of numbers and letters that will only It'll only be a one-way system, so you can't then put the. In fact, let me just let me just do this quickly. So you get this result, and this result is only a one-way system. You cannot chuck that into a sort of an unmd5 function to get the the test value back. Um, there are things like rainbow tables and cracking systems that will run a sort of mapping system against these, but generally speaking, it, it's a one-way system. And it's used so you can do things like if, if, oh God, my fingers are not working. So if MD5 test is equal to MD5 toot, then echo matches checksum. Let's just assume these were two files that we downloaded. Else, oh, what's going on with me today? Echo not matching. So here we'll get an error saying it doesn't match because obviously test and toot don't match. So not matching. But if we did test and test, matches checksum. So we can do echo MD5 just to show you that these two things don't match. Uh, and, line. and echo MD5 of toot. So just to show you that these things don't match, so you've got 098F versus 2F1. 
Um, so again, this this will always be the same. Test MD or MD5 hash test will always be the same, and toot will always be the same. So yeah, you get that? Cool. Sorry. Uh, again, I went on a tangent. I uh, hope that was helpful. So I'm getting a dry mouth. Um, so cryptographic failures, TLS certificate errors. Like I was saying, untrusted certificate, that can be the host name doesn't match. Um, the issued certificate wasn't issued by a trusted authority. So trusted authorities are ones that are stored in your local um, certificate store, which are things like... Um, I can't think of one off the top of my head now. Yeah, don't know. Lost. Okay. Um, oh, Let's Encrypt. Let's Encrypt is a good example because they're free as well. I like them. Uh, but let, Let's Encrypt are a trusted authority. Um, and expired certificates. So obviously if it, uh, a certificate is only valid for, I don't know how long off the top of my head by default, but if you're issuing it yourself, you can issue it for as many years as you want. But if as soon as they become expired they're no longer valid uh deprecated protocols so things like ssl v2 ssl v3 tls v1 tls v1.1 all deprecated they all contain vulnerabilities for different reasons um and they all suck so tls 1.2 and 1.3 are the two recommended at the moment um, there are other things like speedy but for argument's sake tls 1.2 and 1.3 um and weak cipher suites, things like CBC, Triple Des, um, and there's a few others, but they were the ones that came to my head at the time. Uh, again, these are weak ciphers that they, they've got known vulnerabilities with them. CBC produced vulnerabilities like Lucky13, uh, Poodle. I think Beast has something to do with CBC and Gzip. Uh, so yeah, things like that are also considered cryptographic failures. Can I fake a certificate, Skiam says? Not easily, no. Um, yeah, there have been cases of, and in fact, I'm almost certain that um, the Iran nuclear virus, whatever that was called, that fake certificates. Um, I can't remember exactly how it was done, but I, was, I read a book on it and it was really good. Uh, I will find that book, and when I put this on YouTube, I'll mention that in the comments, because that was a really good book. Stuxnet, that's what it was called. Yeah, Stuxnet. Um, yeah, and I'm pretty sure Stuxnet actually stole the certificate keys to sign other certificates, and then they signed their, their virus with sort of that those certificates, and they made it a real thing. Yeah. Um, just before I continue with this, I'm just going to be right back two seconds. Right, I'm back. Sorry about that. I just need a drink. Um, so you've also got symmetric and asymmetric encryption. Again, this isn't necessarily a cryptographic failure. This is just mentioning different types of encryptions here. So symmetric was, uh, generally speaking, an older type of encryption. Uh, it's where you use the same key for encryption and decryption. For example, test123 would be used for encryption of the data. That would be then garbled. And then as long as you use test123 again, it would be de decrypted, degarbled, um, and that was fine. It was faster because obviously it wasn't sort of two things that you had to do with it, um, but it's also considered less secure because obviously potentially you could brute force it easier. Um, An asymmetric encryption. So that is public private key, things like SSH, uh, TLS. They are asymmetric. They are generally considered more secure. Uh, they, they, <laughs> there was a quote from somebody, and I can't remember who it was from, but they said they wanted their public key to be as publicly accessible as possible so everyone could have their public key. Um, that was so people could encrypt messages to him, but only he could have the private key to, to decrypt it, obviously. Um, it's more compl complex to implement. Um, 
obviously, because again, you have to consider two halves of this equation rather than just one. And it's used by things like TLS and SSH. So hashing, again, is used for just obfuscating passwords. Uh, sorry, not just obfuscating passwords, that was silly. Obfuscating passwords, uh, checksum, things like that. It's non-reversible, but it can be vulnerable to collision attacks. So a collision attack is where two hashes of different values collide and they produce the same hash. Uh, that, so that, again, goes back to what I was saying about test, always producing test. But that's not to say that test is the only thing that will produce that hashed value. Uh, there's a great example of this within Google's um, Google's research of SHA-1. I think it was SHA-1. It came out a couple of years back. It was really good. Again, I'll try and link that down below. I forgot all about that when I was writing this. But there are some secure hashing algorithms, things like Bcrypt. Uh, Bcrypt is designed for, I, I believe it's designed for like passwords but it's designed to be slow. So one of the biggest, sorry, one of the, one of the biggest problems with using things like MD5 for a password, I mean, amongst other reasons, but one of the reasons is that it's fast. So to create hundreds of thousands or millions of, upon millions of hashes, it doesn't take that long. But with Bcrypt, I think my GPU gets about 100 hashes a second or something, which is incredibly slow. So to brute force that value would take a long time. Um, it's also secure mathematically for other reasons. Same with SHA-256 and 512. Um, insecure hashing algorithms include things like MD2, MD3, MD4, MD5, SHA-1. Again, they all have collision attacks. They all have, well, most of them have other issues as well. Uh, and Skim says, but you said it doesn't reproduce the same value in hash. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Sorry, mate. You can always ping me after. If I don't get back to your question, mate, ping me after and I'll I'll see what I can do. Uh, crypto failures, remediation. So there are SSL best practices. Uh, there's also hashing best practices. I'm not going to read them all out now, obviously. That would take it forever. Um, but there's a couple there just to read if you want to. Um, obviously, there was no best practices for encryption. Uh, sorry, encoding. Encoding's just encoding. You can sort of do it how you want, how whatever is best for the situation at the time. So moving on to cross-site scripting. Um, this section kind of goes back and forth a bit because, yeah, I'll get to that in a second. So cross-site scripting, it's a client-side vulnerability um, and it occurs when a user's input is, is output directly onto a web page. Um, that ignore the reflected bit there, that's slightly wrong. But it occurs when a user's input is, is returned on a web page. There are four types of cross-site scripting, kind of. There is reflected, persistent, DOM-based, and blind. Um, I'm not going to cover DOM and blind in this. I'm just going to cover reflect and persistent because they're the two sort of main ones you'll come across. Um, but I say blind kind of because blind is just going to be one of the other ones, but in a way that you don't see it. So for example, contact forms, if there's a cross-site scripting vulnerability in a, cro in a contact form, um, you submit that to the server, the server gives it to, for example, somebody who, who's picking up these emails or whatever, and then your payload ex executes on their behalf, on their browser, which then means you don't necessarily see it, but it still executes, so it's blind. Um, there are services like XSS Hunter, which will give you a, a payload and a, and a callback server, so once it, once it executes, it will call back to their server and you can see a hit. Uh, reflected cross-site scripting. So this is where you put a payload into a parameter and it is reflected into the response. And that is pretty much as, as simple as it gets. It doesn't have as much impact as persistent cross-site scripting and it is harder to execute a real attack. Um, so I'll break these down a bit more. It doesn't have as much impact as persistent cross-site scripting because you can't execute 
a mass attack with it. So if you have a single URL and in that URL you have a vulnerable parameter and you can execute um, and you put your payload in that parameter and you send that URL to somebody, they will get popped by that cross-site scripting, at least with any luck. Um, the issue with that is obviously it is only affecting the person that's loading that page. Now there are things like watering hole attacks, which sort of out of scope of this, but that could be used for for that. But generally speaking, reflective cross-site scripting isn't as as effective as, uh, as persistent cross-site scripting. Um, the yeah, so I'll get to why persistent is better or, or more sort of impactful uh, after this sort of section. Uh, yeah, it's harder to execute a real attack. Obviously, if, if I sent somebody a URL that had a big cross-site scripting payload in it, somebody might flag it. Um, if you're doing it to a business, then somebody could report it to their IT desk, you know, their, their um, internal security team, and then they can block that site anyway. Or they can even block that specific URL for that site. So yeah, it, it, it's not as easy to execute a reflective cross-site scripting attack effectively. So this is all that happens. Again, I stole this from somewhere. So the perpetrator discovers a website that has a vulnerability to a script injection. Uh, they inject the website and then for everyone that's sort of visiting that page, they, they get attacked by this cross-site scripting um, and then you can steal their cookies. Once you stole the cookies, you can steal their sessions, um, which is again out of the scope of this sort of talk, but it, it is something that happens with cross-site scripting. So identifying the issue, how, how would you find out, how, how do you test for cross-site scripting? I use things like canaries. So canary is just a string or whatever you want it to be really, that you can enter in and find it in the source code. So I use things like xxxxxx just because it's easy to find. Generally speaking, that string won't be found in lots of other websites. Um, then you can think you then you can add or or take away things like single quotes, double quotes, angle brackets. Um, but the one thing I'd say to this is always check the source code. So in the in the browser, you inject your payload into the parameter. You can then check the source code and you can see whether it's right or not um you'll you'll notice what i mean if you've ever done a cross-site scripting you have to sort of fiddle with it uh, it might not be closed in the right way you might have to encode something but just because it doesn't appear right on the on the web page doesn't mean that you're not still able to get that cross-site scripting payload executed so yeah always check the source so here's a little code example um head stuff obviously but if you're if you've got a, a get parameter of say username and then it says welcome username, depending on whatever you give it, otherwise it just says welcome guest. Um, if if your username is, for example, example.com slash whatever username equals script alert XSS, then this part here would be replaced, which was obviously the, uh, the echo get username would be replaced with your payload. So here you can see, oh, hello, alert XSS. And then obviously you, you, you've got a, you got a cross-site scripting on that page. Um, I tried making that as clear as possible without a real demonstration of cross-site scripting, it's quite hard, but I'll, I'll get to the labs in a minute. So stored and persistent cross-site scripting. <coughs> Sorry. This is the sort of most dangerous version of cross-site scripting, in my opinion. Um, it always has the biggest impact, again, the reason for this is it the cross-site scripting um okay sorry i just checked chat so a cross-site a, a stored cross-site scripting um happens to be stored in either a database or a file or somewhere on the server uh, and basically what happens is you you store the sorry. You store the file. You store the cross-site scripting payload into the database, and then when the page loads, it will grab that data out and it will insert it back into the page. Uh, this happens on every page load where the affected sort of area of the site loads. Uh, this, it, imagine this if if it was in a page, if it was in a home page or a contact page. Every time somebody accessed that page, they would get hit with your payload. 
So it doesn't have to be shared. It doesn't have to be um, sort of emailed around, like phished to anybody. Uh, that's that's why it's more dangerous. And it's accessible to everyone, yeah. So again, the same sort of thing here. Um, it gets stored in the database or the, the victim sends the, the request. Sorry, the victim doesn't. The attacker sends a request to the website. The, the, the victim picks it up. It gets stored in the database and then the victim picks it up. That was all wrong. The attacker sends it to the website. It gets stored in the database. The victim picks it up and then they get attacked. There you go. And here's a good example. Um, similar sort of thing. You've got the, the, the name and the, the, the value in the headers. Um, okay, granted, we are, we're only looking at the cross-site scripting side of this. Um, so you put the cross-site scripting payloads straight into the database, and then once once it loads, it echoes them to the page, which is kind of fine, except if your payloads are cross-site scripting and not real values, then you're going to have an issue. Obviously, it's going to execute those things. You're going to get a persistent cross-site scripting issue. Um, yeah, I don't know why I highlighted that. That's fine. Um, this part will only run if obviously these two values are set, which just means that if nothing is set, then this page will, will load anyway. Um, otherwise, you can insert your own payload. So DOM access, again, I'm not going to go over this into much detail, just um, sort of cover it slightly. It only executes within the DOM, which is the document object module. Document object model. Um, it's a client side vulnerability and it's not as dangerous as reflected or persistent cross site scripting. That's pretty much all you need to know for now. Uh, again, blind XSS is executed without the attacker knowing. That means that, again, it's blind. You send it out to a, somebody else. It gets, or you send it out to a server that gets stored somewhere, gets picked up by somebody else. It gets executed on their browser, but you don't see it on your browser, so it's blind. Um, it can be it, it's submitted into things like forms, uh, headers, parameters, anywhere. So, for example, this can be um, one of the, one of the biggest ones that I've had from this on a bug bounty actually was injecting your cross-site scripting payload into a user agent header. And then that header was stored in a log somewhere. If you fail ten, if you fail ten login attempts, it would be it would get logged, um, and obviously it would log your user agent, which then executed on their browser. So that was fun. That's sort of how blind cross-site scripting works. There, there's a number of things you can do about do with it. Obviously, uh, being if if you're a malicious actor, you could infect their browser or perform internal port scans kind of thing on 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 their browsers. But you can also just call back to a sort of a C2 or a web-based C2 kind of thing. Again, kind of out of scope for this. Um, so remediation. Um, encode your output. It's really not that hard. Um, it, it does have to be context aware. So obviously, if your, Java, if, if your payload is being output into HTML, you need to HTML encode your output. If your payload ends up being in a JavaScript lump, you know, a JavaScript set of um, code. You need to encode it again properly according to that. Luckily, PHP has HTML special characters, which is a good, good function for all of that. It will encode it fine. Um, yeah, that's pretty much where what you have to do. Um, input encode, input sort of sanitization can be done as well, but not, not instead of. Um, there are certain situations where input encoding would help, but again, the only thing that really needs to be done is output encoding. So moving on to SQL injection or SQL injection. Um, it's a server-side vulner vulnerability. Uh, it gives you access to potentially sensitive information, um, anything that's stored in the database. Uh, there are other things that you can do. So you could obviously view other people's data. You could update data. You could um, delete things. It depends how much access the user role of the running user is. Um, I know that was really confusing, but if, if 
when you set up a, a database system for a web app, for example, you normally give a user, a specific user, only one user that's sort of tied to that web app, only certain privileges. So you wouldn't give them the whole sort of root privileges because that would be crazy. Uh, you'd give them, say, maybe read, write, update access. But if they're misconfigured, then there are sort of ways to get shell access. So you can, in um, SQL Server, you can use XP command shell, or you used to be able to use XP command shell. In MySQL, you can read into out file and then write a shell to the web server root. So yeah, lots of things you can do with it. Quite a dangerous attack. That's probably why it's so highly sought after by bug bounty people and pen testers. Um, and this is just a diagram is sort of showing what's going on. And Ross has turned up. Hey, Ross, how's it going, man? This is just, yeah, a, a diagram of it. So uh, payload is sort of apostrophe or one equals one. And th that gets put into a SQL query, which gets executed by the server. And then you sort of either butchered the query to make it work for you or it's spat an error out so you can work from it better. Yeah, there's lots of things. Turn volume up. You're the second person that said this. My volume should be high. Two seconds. If I put it up too high, you'll just not stop hearing me. Is that better? That's better. Okay, cool. Oh, man, I've just done an hour of this, and now you're saying my volume is not up. Oh, well. Here's what it is. Uh, identifying the issue. Obviously, when you're testing for things like SQL injection... <laughs> Okay, when you're testing for things like SQL injection, you want to you want to, your input your payload to sort of start with um, special characters, special characters being characters that the database understands. Things like single quotes, double quotes, percentages, uh, backslashes, anything like that. There's also things you can do like you can try and close the queries again with a single quote or a semicolon. Uh, you can comment out the rest of the query. So only sort of your control section will execute. Uh, you can try type conversion. So one thing I've done in the past is converted things from an array, uh, from a string to an array in the get parameter or, or whatever parameter, um, which won't work for SQL injection, but it might work for identifying a SQL injection. And you can try different operators like the like percent percent thing, which will look for things that are like percent or well, sorry like anything that's between the percents um, if you do percent percent actually i think it escapes the percent sign so here's a code example the you, you get three post um variables here and you put them into the sql query and then you execute the query and then you get the results but the problem with this is obviously in here they're just going straight into the database. They're going straight into the SQL query. So if you change your post, one of the post post variables with a payload, then we can see that the SQL, sorry, it's really confusing watching my phone at the same time. Um, if, if you put the payload straight into the into the SQL query, you can sort of cut off what, what, what was originally happening and now you control that end part of the query. And that is more sort of viewable here. So we can see our injected payload closed off that previous quote. And then we've done a sort of just an all one equals one, which is always true. Um, and then we comment off the rest of this query. So that just gets ignored. And then we have a valid query that we can control. Remediation for SQL injection. Uh, again, only one thing to do, and that's just parameterize your queries. Always use prepared statements. It's not, not rocket science. And yet still so many people fail at it. So labs, favorite part of the stream. Uh, OWASP, OWASP juice shop. Uh, obviously, this has to be mentioned because we're talking about OWASP as well. Um, this is a great sort of lab. Great. It's a self-hosted -host lab. I guess it can be called a lab. Sort of a practice area. You can tune your skills. It's got a lot of common vulnerabilities in it. Um, yeah, great great place to test, test your skills out. Uh, Port Swigger Labs, which is probably what I'm going to do in a minute. Uh, it's made by the people that make Burp Suite, which is
Ross, I'm going to get back to you on that. Portswiger Labs. Uh, yeah, Portswiger is great. They've made some really great labs. Really, one of my favorite things to do, actually, is just sit there and own some of these labs. That's how sad I am. Try Hack Me. I've not used Try Hack Me personally, but I've heard great things about it. Um, they have a free and a premium version. Um, I think quite a few people that I know use Try Hack Me, and they, they really like it. Um, as far as I understand it, it's more of a guided hacking thing. So they'll give you certain things that they want you to find or, or, or execute, like run nmap with this command or with these flags and then get the results. So, yeah. So, yeah, it, it, as far as I understand it, it's, it's pretty good. Hack the Box is one of my favorite environments. It gives you access to sort of full... I mean, containerized, but still full sort of vulnerable systems from from no access all the way up to root access, uh, which is great fun. Again, one of my favorite. And Vulnhub is, again, similar to um, Juice Shop, where you download your own custom ISO or whatever they've written it on, and you just boot it up into VMware or VirtualBox or whatever, and you own it from your own computer, which is also really fun. Had a lot of fun on these before. Uh, great way of learning. It is running things on your own machine. And that is all of the slides. Death by PowerPoint is over. Right, let's move on and do some fun, fun bits. Uh, how do I do this? Yeah, now I need to move that down. Does... Ah... Right, open browser. Come on, this this works, right? Of course. Now I think I think I can just log in with this. Why are you going on there? No. Oh, it's because it's paused in birth, isn't it? There you go. I'm just trolling. Yeah, mate, because I almost I, I almost died when he said that. How was your you were in the sauna, mate. What are you what oh god that's my password. Oh I'm gonna have to change that now, aren't I? Well, that's that gone. What a waste of time that was. <laughs> Uh, research. Is it research? No, it's Academy. Of course it's Academy. And let's go for uh, all labs. What shall we do? Let's pick one that is broken access control, cross-site scripting. Mm. Access control. Okay, I've done them all. Um, ah, insecure direct object references. Exactly what I want. Although I've already solved it, let's do it anyway. Select the. No, don't see the solution. Not the solution. But what was the goal? Lab description, that's what I want. Lab stores, uh, check logs in the file system. Okay. Now, okay. Where's Beb? Not really played with Burt Black uh, Playground. Got the yeah, I, yeah. I've got the same mate. I haven't done it yet. I have every intention to do. It. I just just haven't done it. All right. So let's test send. That's a web socket.
connected. Ah, your password is. Ah, sorry, I, I didn't explain any of that. I just did it. Um, right, let me go back into, let's, let's just start again. So in here, in the live chat, you can send your messages and you can also view transcript. And every time you download it, you get a file downloaded. So two, three, four, five dot text. Um, the, the, the issue here is it obviously, you know, it starts with two rather than one. So you're expecting a one dot text to be found somewhere. So intercept this, write a message, test, and just see what happens. Uh, and then view transcript. And you can see that eventually you get a six, uh, download transcript six dot text. Send that to a repeater. And we see six dot text. That's fine. But what happens when we change it to one dot text? And then we get this transcript, which isn't ours. And we see, okay, my password is this. And we know the user is Carlos because it's always Carlos. So we need Carlos and that password. And there you go. And I've solved the lab. Mad hacks. I know. I'm a G. Uh, and the next one. Should we do one more? I think we'll do one more. Uh, back to lab. Yeah, girl. Uh, all labs. I don't know what to do. Should we do... We got cross-site scripting. Oh, this is SQL injection. Uh, okay, let's do a SQL injection one as well. Uh, let's do both of these as well. Which one did I just load? That's stored. Right, SQL injection, access lab. I don't even want to see what I have to do. Right, so again, the first thing we look for is places to inject our payload into. And the first one we see is this product ID. And I don't know if this is right. Invalid product ID. Invalid product ID. Okay, maybe it's not. Uh, usually, it's not that difficult on these things. Internal server. So we got an internal server on this. So the chances of this category parameter being vulnerable is quite high. Um, let's just do an all one equals one. See what happens. So we get a valid response back. Um, and if we do all one equals, sorry, if we do. Uh, let's do and one equals one. So we do get stuff back. And then if we do an and one equals two, we can probably say we get nothing back here. Yeah. Okay, easy. So we can prove there's a SQL injection there. How easy is it to see this? Um, I'm sorry I didn't set up my Streamlabs to be sort of uh, that close on the URL. So Ross, let me know. Can you see my... Uh, can you see my URL okay? If not, I will move over to burp and send it to repeater and see if... Uh, I don't know how I'll do this. Nick, the URL is bad, but I can see the page's header. Yeah, that's true. Cool, okay. Um, so let's do an order by and see how many columns we have. Order by two, order by three. Order by four. Nope. Okay, so it's three columns. Sweet. And so we go union or select one, two, three. Uh, union. No. Motor. Union select one, two, three. Okay. No, no, no. Weird. Oh. That's I've sold the sold the lab multiple times. Okay. I'm gonna guess that was the point of the lab, was it? Uh, determining the number of columns returned by the query. Okay, that was it, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. That, that was all I had to do. Um, that was fun. I enjoyed that. That was 
Obviously, I've done that one before. So, cross site scripting, let's try this one. To solve, submit a comment that calls alert function when the blog post is viewed. Okay. We can do that. I think next time, well, not next time, but next time we do the, the stream, this sort of thing, um, when I dive deeper into the specific issues like SQL injection, I'll, I'll cover like five or six or seven labs because that way we can see a bit more of what's going on. Um, I'll also set up my, my stream better so we can actually look at the, the uh, <laughs> look, look at the URL and things. Um, I'll have to have a look how we do it because this is the first time I've sort of done this in a long time. So a blog post, um, cool, let's leave a comment. Test, 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 at test.com, and test.com. Uh, HTTPS, no, why, no. No, go away. Right. Yeah, a magnifier is a good idea. I think I'll do that. Uh, my comment has been submitted. Okay. Cool. So let's just do. In fact, like I was saying earlier, you want to use a canary for this. So we've used test. So we can. I mean, test was probably a bad choice, but in here you can see that we're stuck inside p tags here. I mean, not that the p tags matter; they're not going to hinder us in any way. But you can see exactly how we sort of escape potentially what what could have been sort of something more difficult to escape from. So we can just do test script alert one. I don't know, what was it? Script alert, cross site scripting? I can't remember. Was there anything I need to do with that? Yeah, we'll try. Same with there, and then test and test. There we go, and that worked. Yeah, cross site scripting, there we go. Perfect. So the final one I'm going to do is to solve the lab, perform a cross site scripting attack that calls the alert function. Okay. Uh, is there effective cross site scripting? And yeah, this will be the last lab. I'm just going to try that straight in there and see what happens. Oh. Well, that was the first thing I did. Um, yeah, that probably wasn't the best best uh, way to show you that uh, now, now I've screwed it so you've got test here I'm just going to try and show you what I was doing here test so it says here zero search I can zoom these in h1 uh, zero search results found for test and then you can see that our payload is script alert cross site scripting and that's exactly where I injected it and then obviously when the page loads it gets, it gets executed so yeah, that is everything. Um, crap, that was my headphones shouting at me. Um, yeah, that is everything done. And I appreciate everyone's time. Thank you for joining. Hopefully next time I'll be a bit more prepared for the labs. Uh, I'll, have a, I'll have a magnifier or something. I mean, do something with it. But anyway, yeah, take it easy, everyone. Have a good night and see you later.